Hello and welcome back to the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture of Indian Institute, Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, these lectures are for students in the IITs and other engineering colleges. The role of humanities and social sciences is quite significant in the curriculum of engineering students. I am Krishna Barwa. I teach literature in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Guwahati. We are presently in the lecture series Language and Literature and this module 3 of the series is titled History of English Literature. We are in lecture 5 of this module titled The Romantics. Let us recap of what we had done in the previous lectures. Why, why is it necessary to know the background of history, lit, history of English literature in understanding literature? There is an awareness of the canon or the delights of the history of English literature edition. It is necessary to know what is about the study of English literature. It helps in the understanding of text, of the literary output, of the role of creativity and of the social conditions which prevailed during that time. We want you to be introduced to the spirit of the age and the ideals of the nation's history. We enjoy, let us enjoy the literary his journey of poems, stories and plays, the socio-political milieu which uh, could be from the Victorian era or even as far back as sources times. In lecture 1, we have seen how Anglo-Saxon literature revealed five striking characteristics, the love of freedom, reverence for womanhood, responsiveness to nature, especially in her sterner, sterner moods. While we are doing these lectures, let us see how there is this evolutionary of ideas from one age to the, uh, to the other. It is not that one age suddenly opens up new ideas, but it is something which is already there dormant probably and which has already struck roots in the previous era and it comes out into a new form in the next age. So, while we were doing the Anglo-Saxon period and sources time, we have seen how nature was a predominant factor and all poetry was earnest and somber and it was pervaded by fatalism and religious feelings. In lecture 2, we went to the age of Shakespeare and the greatness of Shakespeare's achievement was largely made possible by the work of his immediate predecessors, Spencer and Sidney in the mastery of us. We will be doing romantics today and we will see how Spencer had a great contribution in, uh, in the poetical creativity of the time and Marlowe and the university wits who had a great contribution in drama and how the power of human reason to interpret man and nature in the dignity of modern English as a literary medium. In module 3, we did Milton and his times and Shakespeare and Milton were the two figures that towered conspicuously in both separate ages. Each was representative of his age that produced him two ages have been named after them, one the age of Shakespeare and the age of Milton and together they formed a suggestive commentary upon the two forces that rule literature, the force of impulse and the force of fixed purpose. While we were in lecture 4, we did the Augustan age and there we found how from 1700 to 1745 the neoclassical age, the age of reason or enlightenment where there was pertaining to rules to decorum prevailed and in every preceding age we have noticed especially the poetical works which constitute the glory of English literature. More so in the previous ages of Shakespeare we found poetry as well as drama. Now for the first time in lecture 4 we have seen how for we must chronicle the triumph of English prose. And this was the history of the book. In order to bring about reforms, votes were now necessary and to get votes, the people of England must be approached with ideas, facts, arguments, information. There was change of government, there was need for a public opinion. So, the newspaper was born and literature in its widest sense including the book, the newspaper and the magazine became the safe instrument of a nation's progress. This was in 
lecture 4 of the Augustinese. So, some characteristics of Augustine poetry were the concept of individualism versus society. Society takes in a very, very important role here, the imitation of the classics, that is why it was called the classical age, politics, social issues, satire, irony, empiricism and comedy. Now, while we look into this transition between the Augustine period and the romantic period, there was a drastic shift in literary ideals. Let us look into the literary uh, spectacle or the literary climate. The Augustines followed the works of former classical writers such as Horace, Virgil and Homer. The middle of the 18th century was a period of transition therefore, and ex experiment in poetic styles and subjects. Now, the stability which English thought and society regained in the end of the 17th century could not be in the nature of things be long maintained and the unstable equilibrium of Queen Anne's period gave way to a more complex and more obviously contradictory attitudes. Melancholy interest in the civilized and the odd a sense of change, mind you will find all this in the romantic age too. Some of all the states of mind are seen quite early in the century and by the time we arrive at the industrial revolution somewhere around 1760 to 1840 produced a very different view of the value of life in urban society. This is town life, urban from the found, from that found in Queen and in writers. Now, the shifts in view, let us examine the shifts of view of the nature and function of poetry now. From the view that poetry is essentially imitation of human nature, which was laid out by Aristotle as that poetry is mimesis and the test of a work of literature is the degree to which it communicates its imitation with pleasure and edification to its audience. We now come to a shift where it has led to perception not to imitation, to the view that poetry has for its major function the expression of the poet's emotion and that the relation of the poem to the poet is more significant than its relation to the audience. Please. Uh, try to note this, this shift which was there from mimesis to what you find the perception. Such a movement proceeds in a variety of ways throughout the century. So, now while we are going into the most beautiful uh, period of, uh, of, of uh, English literature, the romantic, the romantics and this is lecture 5, let us see how we arrive at this age. No level can accurately describe a period which was so rich and varied in achievement as the 50 years following the death of Johnson, which, uh, which we did in the previous lecture. Romanticism, if we want to explain, it is a movement that arose so gradually in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It was a gradual uh, development marking the reaction in literature, philosophy, art, religion and politics from the neoclassicism and formal orthodoxy of the preceding period. Romanticism surely is a widening of the imaginative horizon. So, when we look into it, we find that it is a widening of the imaginative horizon, yes, definitely yes, a sharpening of emotional sensibility, a complete involvement of emotion or a passion for whatever one was doing. At its onset, it drives those who feel its spell into strange bypaths, because it dealt with imaginative horizons. So, therefore, there was no uh, boundaries to what you can imagine and filling away from the broad highway of ordinary human experience. It was thus with Marlowe in his world moving visions, thus with Scott in his fervent medievalism. So, you might ask the question, was not Shakespeare a romantic? was not Marlowe a romantic? Yes, definitely yes, they had their core of imagination going into different ways and Scott in his own way also went into the past to show his different avenues of creativity. So, generally if you want to see romanticism, you want to define romanticism, we will have to see that it is uh, as the Oxford companion to English literature describes that it is a literary movement and profound shift in sensibility. There is a profound change in sensibility, which took place in Britain and throughout Europe roughly between 1770 and 1848. 
right. Intellectually it marked a violent reaction to the enlightenment, politically it was inspired by the revolutions in America and France, emotionally it had expressed an extreme assertion of the self. Almost you might ask the question why assertion of the self was also in the renaissance, it was also in the time of Shakespeare, but here you will find it is almost a revival of what those tenets were there. I had told you in the beginning that every age or its preceding age always carries tenets of something which goes into the other. It is not that it is a drastic change, it is somewhere an evolutionary uh, way of ideas which goes into the making of the other space. Socially it championed progressive causes, stylistic keynote of romanticism, romanticism is intensity, it was profound involvement in whatever sphere and its watchword is imagination. So, the romantic revival if we see ultimately it brings us back to the highway only at a greater elevation which was already there, but if we go into a heightened consciousness. We seek it first in the thunder and the earthquake of the fantastic and the bizarre, these are words from Compton Rickett, exaggeration and aloofness and find it after all in the still small voice of everyday life. It is not that it is the fantastic and the bizarre is not present or only in something exotic, it is also in the everyday life. In other words, romanticism is not opposed to reality. So, let us keep in mind that whatever is reality is not something dull and prosaic, but you can find avenues of romanticism in everyday life. It is reality which is transfigured by new powers of vision and feeling. When you come to the modern times, you will find there is something called magic realism and you will find that realism is something which is given a magic proportions. Here too in romanticism, we will find that reality is being transfigured by new powers of seeing and by new perceptions of feeling as well as of vision. In the deep sense of the word, Marlowe and Scott are realists because of their romanticism. When you look into the Elizabethan age, we find Marlowe was equally a realist because he was uh, uh, representing what was in actual life because of their romanticism. Scott realized it perfectly in his faithful pictures of Scottish life and character. Well, so stated simply and generally, the features most insistent at this period are first the spiritualizing of nature and the humanizing of social life. Two things we have to keep in mind that first was that nature becomes a sort of a spiritual uh, trope, it is something where you find Godhead in every form and the humanizing of social life. The supreme romantic movement in English letters was the renaissance as we have already noted. It had transformed not only English, but European life, but like every great impulse in art and life, it had been followed by a period of reaction, everything has a reaction. The romantic revival was the result of no one cause, not one cause, broadly speaking it was the inevitable corollary of the renaissance and the renaissance reformation. The dignity and importance of man as man, where it is man centric and the glories of the world of nature. These ideas of which we hear so much at the close of the 18th century, we have seen it in Shakespeare, where man was a, a subject of introspection and speculation, were born centuries before. And this as students, you must know that when we divide the ages into different uh, history of English literature into different ages, we do it only for the sake of uh, the developments which go into it, but there are continuing uh, uh, tropes and there are continuing characteristics which go into the making of each age. And it had been gradually working in men's mind throughout all the political unrest of the 17th and 18th century. Well, while we are doing literature uh, students, you must 
please keep in mind that when we read a poem or we read a text or a work of fiction, it is always good to know the background of the times. It is always good to know the social conditions of the times. It is always good to know the history of the times, because this has different impact upon the consciousness of the writers. And the literary output which comes out has markings of representations, which go into the making of a text. Well, and therefore, our sole aim in this lecture series is that you should be uh, sensitive to the way a literary text opens up and you should be sensitive in how you appreciate a poem or a, or a text. Well, so coming back to the first flowering of romanticism in England, the bloody horrors of the French revolutions which had happened, the dwindling of a new idealistic philosophy in Germany under Kant and Hegel, all the German influence was so strong during this period, even though the French revolution had inspired ideals of liberty, fraternity and equality, yet we find the German philosophers with their in depth understanding of aesthetics of a romanticism were a great influence upon English literature. The political upheaval in America, all these things were but varying symptoms of a general fermentation that had lasted on from the 15th century. And while we are doing this, let us keep in mind what T. S. Eliot had said that every age every critic, every poet has to have a historical sense. The meaning of the historical sense is not that you have to know history, but it is something of being aware of what is going on all around you, not only political, but geographical as well as cultural as well as literary. And doing so, we will be able to contribute something to what is going on. Rousseau and the French Revolution, let us go into one of the main thinkers who had influenced English romanticism too. He played an important and inspirational role in guiding the course of romanticism in England. The ideas which gave birth to the French revolution were propagated by Rousseau and other French philosophers like Diderot and Voltaire. And Rousseau gave a call for the return to nature, because nature now becomes the predominant motive. He revived the cult of the noble savage and condemn social institutions as many chains fettering the free movement of humanity. The essential self, the natural self, which is unfettered by any artificiality or by any urban conditions. In his social contract, he said, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. The virtual identity between high romanticism and revolution marks the French visionary Rousseau as the central man of romantic tradition. Just now, we had also mentioned that German philosophers like Kant and Hegel, they were also great uh, inspirations to the romantic movement. Although the battle cry of the revolutionaries, liberty, equality and fraternity impress itself on the youthful imagination of Wordsworth and Coleridge, the general characteristics of the revival arose in verse and fiction. During the lifetime of Pope, it was not only during this time, but it was in the preceding age itself and impressed many an imagination long before the overthrow of the Bastille. So, the intention of this lecture is that whatever was romantic was not that it came sprung up all of a sudden, but it was something which had its roots in the preceding ages. Even if you go back into the Anglo Saxon period, you find the romantic uh, uh, wonder at something which is awe inspiring nature on the dignity of man were very much prevalent at that time. And those characteristics have also gone into the romantic periods. So, you might ask sometimes then do not you think that those periods were also the romantics? Yes, definitely yes, but this is the romantic revival as an age that we are looking into. We can look at Shakespeare's plays as romantic plays and Spencer as romantics. Yes, definitely yes. It was embodied most strongly in the visual arts, music and literature, but had a major impact on historiography, education and the natural sciences. 
its effect on politics was considerable and complex, the dignity of man about equality, liberty, fraternity, while for much of the peak romantic period, it was associated with liberalism and radicalism we find in the poems of Shelley. In the long term, its effect on the growth of nationalism was probably, probably the most significant. Well, so, when we look into this historical background 1790 to 1830, well, so let us see the close of the 18th century saw England and France engaged in open warfare, hostilities dragged on till 1815, in the end bringing about the extinction of the French Republic, the birth of which was greeted so joyfully by the English liberals. It is necessary for you to study history too, when you study literature it is always nice to know the history of the times, because the history helps a lot in showing what was the impact upon the social conditions as well as on the political conditions. And the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty, these events had the effects on every corner of Europe, it was a big backlash and in none more strongly than in England. The elder writers of the period with Wordsworth and Coleridge as conspicuous examples hailed the new era with joy. Social condition, the conclusion of the long war brought inevitable misery, naturally there were low wages, unemployment, heavy taxation which gave you know more social conditions, you know works which were of more social content and awareness. The interest in social conditions became intensified towards the end of the 19th century until it has grown to be one of the chief features of modern literature. Supposed to be the most fertile period of literature, the romantic, romantic age, abundant output, even the lavishness of the Elizabethans cannot excel that of this age. The development of new ideas brings fresh inspiration for poetry. How do we go back to the essence? How do we go back to the primal inspirations? And the political sky is bright with luminaries of the first magnitude. In prose, we note especially the fruitful yield of the novel, we have the essay and the unprecedented activity of critical and miscellaneous writers. Theory comes in for the almost for the first time here, and we have different theoretical treatises on how to write poem, how to look at a drama, etc. Therefore, romanticism as a term, the most uh, the aspect most trends in France is reflected in Victor Hugo's phrase liberalism in literature, okay? meaning especially the freeing of the artist, the artist is absolutely free and the writer from restraints and rules. So, there is no, not the condition of knowing grammar as such which was in the previous age suggesting that phase of individualism marked by the encouragement of revolutionary political ideas. So, it was a two way traffic, political ideas reflected on the literary output and the literary output reflected on the political ideas. The poet Hein German noted the chief aspect of German romanticism in calling it the revival of medievalism in art, letters and life. So, you have to understand this. He said that it was the revival of medievalism. When we look at medievalism, what do you understand by medievalism? It has something primitive, it has something exotic, it has something strange, it has the beauty which is unknown, untrammeled, absolutely undiscovered and he said that this was something which romantics also tried to explore. Walter Pater thought the addition of strangeness to beauty. The neoclassicists have insisted on order in beauty, but here it is strangeness to beauty constituted the romantic temper. So, you can see the contrast. The neoclassicists in the previous lecture they said that there had to be order, there has to be discipline, there has to be decorum if one has to be really creative, and here it, it is the strangeness to beauty, just as Walter Peter had said. Romanticism, the predominance of imagination over reason and formal rules which is the age of classicism and over the sense of fact or the actual realism. But we had already noted that the romantics were also realist when they, because they had transfigured realism by their perception, by their vision, but by their sight. A formula that recalls Hazlitt's statement in 1816 
is that the classic beauty of a Greek temple, this is a very beautiful example, resided safely in its actual form and its obvious connotations, is not it. Whereas, what is the romantic beauty? The romantic beauty of a gothic building or ruin, it is absolutely in ruins, but there are implications of something which is there in the past of uh, not everything transparent arose from associated ideas that the imagination was stimulated to conjure up. This is the role of imagination and a beautiful example which Heslitt had given. So, therefore, if we look into this, look at the key figures who were there in this romantic uh, revival, Wordsworth from 1770 to 1850, Coleridge, then Byron, then Shelley, Keats, Scott, Austin, Lamb, De Quincey. Austin, Lamb, De, Lamb, De Quincey, they are the essayists, Austin, Scott, Scott is a poet, was a poet as well as a, a fiction writer. Jane Austen well known for her novels, then we have the first generation of uh, romantic poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge, the second generation, Byron, Shelley and Keats. We have many other minor poets who, which I have not included here, because uh, I thought that it would be better that if we uh, look into the key figures. Well, so let us look into the role of nature, the spiritualizing of nature. Wordsworth found brooding and tranquilizing thought at the heart of nature. Shelley was an ardent and persuasive love in other words, they spiritualized nature. Only gradually did they realize that to find this element of wonder, this element of wonder which is there in nature, they do not have to go back to the medieval age or strangeness, they need not delve in the remote past as uh, many of the romantic poets have also done. Scott has done that, even Coleridge, but it was at the hand, it arose from the natural simplicity which they lauded the mysticism of everyday life. So, everyday life took on a magic of its own, everyday life took on a mystic of its own and the magic of the earth, the witchery of the seasons. An ordinary sunset or the garrulity of an old seaman, the rain bearing wind, the song of a nightingale, these are the things that inspire to great achievement of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley and Keats. Therefore, when we look as an overview of the romantic sensibility, what do we see? Is it that it is only the play at imagination, it is the complete involved sensibility. Therefore, consciousness studies makes a big impact upon here, if you want to see how the mind works, how perception sees how you look at the thing. So, there is a, uh, there is a uh, difference between imitation and perception. Uh, M. H. Abrahams in his book, The Mirror and the Lamp had brought in this uh, divide. He said that the mirror reflects and the lamp ultimately it gives a light of its own. So, therefore, we find how we can combine these two. So, there was sensibility, primitivism, love of nature, sympathetic interest in the past, mysticism, individualism, romantic criticism and a reaction at whatever characterized neoclassicism or rules. Now, this humanizing of social life, because there was at the throes of the French Revolution, you have to remember that the dignity of man was so very important. Other feature of that time is closely connected with the heightened appreciation of natural beauty, for it impelled an attraction towards simple and elemental qualities everywhere. And this made for the humanizing of life, where human interface became very important, not something where there was a go between. So, you went and accosted nature face to face or human life with all its simplicities, man in his essential self was of great uh, uh, focus and imaginative sensibility to both the poetry and prose of that time. Literary and philosophical theory, if we look into this, that tends to see the individual at the center of all life, right? And it places the individual, therefore, at the center of all. This is very much like in Ranasa too, the individual was at the center of life, making literature valuable as an expression of unique feelings and particular attitudes. 
the expressive theory of criticism, which I had just mentioned the mirror and the lamp in portraying experience more than it values adherence to completeness, unity or the demands of nature. So, each one has his own way of expressing his reaction to nature. Romanticism saw in nature a revelation of truth, the liberal government of God as it was said and a more suitable subject for art than those aspects of the world sullied by artifice. So, there was nothing to do with which was man made or something which was uh, uh, urbane. Romanticism seeks to find the absolute the ideal by transcending the actual whereas, realism finds its values in the actual and naturalism in the scientific laws that undergird the actual. If you want to bring in these divisions, you can very well make the definitions like that. Therefore, coming back to this change, the romantic poetry was in direct contrast to the characteristics cultivated by the neoclassical English poets. We have already seen that, is not it? Poetry of the school of Dryden, Pope and Johnson were mainly what? They were the product of intelligence. There was a lot of cultivation of the arts, of the grammar, of the rules and the decorum. It was exclusively poetry of town life. Here now, when we come here, romantic movement was a reaction against the above characteristics of the classical poetry. The romantic movement was marked and is always marked by a strong reaction and protest against the bondage of rule and custom, which in science and theology as well as in literature generally tend to fetter the free human spirit. The romantic poetry is marked by endless variety and individuality. So, if you say individuality is one and uniform, we will be wrong to say that is not it. Each one of you are different in your own way is not it. And therefore, we find that romantic poetry therefore, has its own sense of variety and its own diverse individuality. However, it enjoyed no unchartered freedom. Romantic poets sought inspiration and guidance from Spencer, yes remember Shakespeare and Milton. In this way, romantic poetry was in the nature of a revival of many say Elizabethan romanticism. So, going back to the literary characteristics of the age, we see at first it reflected in the turmoil of the age, political turmoil. Then, when the turmoil was over, literature suddenly developed a new creative spirit, a new creativity, a new awareness, a new perception, a new uh, understanding of what was the meaning of life, which shows itself in the poetry of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats and the prose of Scott. Uh, Jane Austen, Lamb and De Quincey, a wonderful group of writers. Even Wordsworth fired with political enthusiasm could write, he could write this, bliss was it in the dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. The sense of romanticism was that literature must reflect all that is spontaneous. So, this youth, this youthful inspiration or imagination which was there was ultimately unaffected in nature and in man and be free to follow its own fancy in its own way. In Coleridge, we see this independence expressed in Kubla Khan, where he goes into the populous orient, then in the ancient Mara, who, where Mariner, where he goes into the lonely sea. In words of this literary independence, led him inward to the heart of common things. As he said, find tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones and good in everything. So, words were Scott and Shelley. In dealing with the poetry of the time, who are the key figures? We have already seen them, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Byron, Shelley. So, abundant in quantity as well as rich in quality, each one different from the next. The earliest forerunners of the romantic revival of course, we have to remember was Blake, William Blake who expressed in his songs of innocence both the mysticism and the homely delight of common things. And thus, Blake and William Blake can be called the godfather both to the ancient mariner as well as Wordsworth pastoral domesticities. I think most of you have already read Blake's The Lamb and the Tiger. You have to see the contrast of beauty which he finds in the gentle lamb and the, and the strength of the tiger. The same love of simple joys animates the work of Cowper, the, the pre romantics we can call them. These two poets foreshadow the work of Wordsworthian group and hint at the kinship with all sentient 
things which is the link. So these are the romantics, Wordsworth, we have Byron, we have Shelley, we have Keats and the romantics again, Satie, Scott and uh, Coleridge as well as Macaulay. In Ian Osby observes that the English romantic poets belong to two distinct generations, came from disparate backgrounds which I said the first generation, second generation differed sharply in theory and practice, maybe so, held conflicting political views, some of them were for the revolution, some were against the revolution, the, the aims of liberty, fraternity and equality, some way got diluted and later there was disillusionment and again there was this hope disliked each other. The poetry of romantic revival, if we look into it, transformed from town to country life. This was what we said from the urban to the rural and from the artificial decorations of drawing rooms to the beauty and loveliness of nature, there to the joys of nature and the elemental simplicity of life. If you look at the root poems of words, what you find goes into the highlands. The lives of common people, shepherd and cottages in a language as close as possible to ordinary speech. So, it was the language, we will come to the lyrical ballads, where the language that you write and the theme that you present and the motive that you present has to be conversant with one another. They took delight in depicting natural objects, birds, flowers, hills, forests, streams, glades, wind and power. So, each one of you can experiment with this, you have to also fashion out your own vocabulary, you have to find out your own language which has to be conversant with the simplicity of the, of the theme that you are presenting. Such common subjects as a solitary reaper, a cuckoo, a skylark and daffodils breed a sense of wonder in Wordsworth poetry. Many say that Romanticism in uh, especially the romantic revival of the 19th century in English literature was full of wonder. This sense of wonder, amazement at everything all around us, the phenomena, even at man as an intrinsic human being, these were things which were explored. At. Empathically, however, even though the novel also took on different forms in this age, it was the romantic age was an age of poetry. The glory of the age is in the poetry of Scott, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats, Moore and Sutton. Of his prose work naturally, those of Scott alone have attained a very wide reading of course, as well as we have uh, Jane Austen, Charles Lamb as an essayist, novels of uh, Jane Austen have won their authors a secure place in the history of English literature. So, specific characteristics, the abundant if we look into the syntax of the rules which are there, if there are rules in the romantic revival. Abandonment of the heroic couplet in favor of blank verse, we find the blank verse coming in again from the time of Shakespeare. We have the sonnet coming in, we have the Spenserian standard, we have the lyric coming in and many experimental verse forms. The dropping of the conventional poetic diction in favor of fresher language and bolder figures, the idealization of rural life, enthusiasm for the wild, grotesque, irregular in nature and art unrestrained imagination, enthusiasm for the natural, sentimental melancholy as in Gray Thomas Gray, emotional psychology in fiction as in Richardson, collection and imitation of popular ballads, renewed interest in Spencer, Shakespeare and Milton. Typical little forms were the lyric which I had just mentioned, the love lyric, reflective lyric, the nature lyric and the lyric of morbid mel uh, melancholy. We have the sentimental novel, the metrical romance, the sentimental comedy, the ballet, the problem novel, the historical novel, the gothic romance, the sonnet and the critical essay. I had told you in the beginning, it is variety in its diversification, in its individuality, the romantic uh, age in its creative output was abundant and most fascinating. The supreme romantic movement in English literature was the Renaissance, as we have noted, which had brought about a transformation not only in English, but also in European, French revolution in 1789, publication of Wordsworth and Coleridge lyrical ballads in 1798. So, if we want to date this romantic uh, age, let us take it in 1798 with the publication of the 
uh, lyrical ballads by Wordsworth and Coleridge. So, what uh, does the lyrical ballad say? The lyrical ballad was a landmark in the history of the revival of the romantic movement in England. It was a sort of a critical theory treatise and Coleridge not only revived the romantic tendencies, but also raised the banner of revolt against 18th century classicism. So, it was uh, in the nature of a strong protest against 18th century and sharpened sensibilities and heightened imaginative feelings. The prevailing attitude favored innovation as against traditionalism in the materials, forms and styles of literature. So, we have to really take, take into note the way that poetry was written, the forms in which it was written, the language in which it was written and in the themes in which it was written. What was prefaced in lyrical ballads is uh, important to note, it was written as a poetic manifesto, we will have to see it as a poetic manifesto. Uh, or statement of revolutionary aims in which he denounced the poetic diction of the preceding century. That was a great thing to do and proposed to deal with materials from common life in a selection of language really used by men. Note this really used by men. What's what serious treatment of lowly subjects in common language violated the basic neoclassic rule of decorum because this was decorum was something which was cultivated and here it is language which is actually used by men colloquial language which asserted that the serious genres should deal with only high subjects in an appropriately elevated type. The volume contained a few pieces by his friend Coleridge the lyrical ballads among them the ancient marina and its appearance may fairly be said to mark an epoch in the history of English poetry. So, note that the lyrical ballads became a manifesto where how poetry was to be written, how a poem is to be written was really uh, laid out. Wordsworth regarded himself as a reformer of poetry, his innovations were twofold. Number one, in subject matter and in diction. Okay. He said that the subject matter has to be changed as well as the diction. The principal object which I proposed to myself in this poem, he said, was to choose incidents and situations from common life. Okay. Low and rustic life was generally chosen because in that condition the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity and are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. Because it was close to nature, people were sincere, people had connections with the elemental forces of life. Therefore, language as well as man becomes different. In his preface to lyrical ballads, Wordsworth repeatedly declared that what is good poetry? Good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. So, this was just the opposite of what? we had done in the previous age in the classical age. It is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and he carefully qualified this radical doctrine by describing his poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility. You just remember when mind is at peace, when mind is complete tranquil state only then consciousness leaves that state of emotion which you can recollect and only then poetry comes out. And by specifying that a poet's spontaneity is the result of a prior process of deep reflection and may be followed by second thoughts and revisions. So, it may be followed by second thoughts and revisions. So, spontaneity is being cultivated by another uh, process of reflection, but the immediate act of composition if a poem is to be genuine must be spontaneous. So, he is the poet of man just as Browning was the poet of man, man plural. So, we will come to Browning in the Victorian age. The matter of the universe was for Wordsworth merely the feature of a great spiritual power, a rock, a flower, a sunset, whatever, and this is the underlying thought of Tintern Abbey. It is the burden of the autobiographical and philosophical fragment, the prelude. When we come to Coleridge, we find another giant, his peer, 
best poetry are from 1790 to 1800. In no other poet of the time is the sense of mystery more finely developed. It is completely different from Wordsworth. Here we find the sense of mystery, magic, mastery of rhythm and meter gave him a complete different niche in English poetry, especially the old ballet measure in the ancient Marina and in producing the ghostly atmosphere of medieval romance. When we come to Walter Scott, the lay of the last minstrel, Marmion and the lady of the lake, we find he may have liked the lyric passion of Burns, another Scottish po poet, but or of Keats or witchery of Coleridge and Keats, but he is unexcelled in narrative force and clearness. Then not content with exploiting the folklore of his country, he pushed eastward and attained his greatest vogue in dealing with oriental subjects. This is Robert Sati. We come to the next generation, the most beautiful uh, group of poets, most romantic, most tragic at the same time of the romantic poets. Shelley is empathically the poet of eager sensitive youth, the spiritual youth of the visionary and reformer. In his earlier years, Godwin was the figure, he was a great follower of Godwin, who most readily impressed his mobile imagination and in many of the poems dealing with social subjects. Completely restless, completely one who was uh, looking out for a new millennium and he is little more than Godwin made musical, but the most potent inspiration came to Shelley from Greek literature as we will see in uh, Keats. Shelley like his admirer Browning needed the sunshine of the south to rouse his finest powers. Alastair is the splendid product of his first acquaintance with the Alps and his loveliest lyrics and his odes were written under Italian skies. Two notes dominate. Shelley's uh, work, epic narrative alike, his devotion to liberty. So, this was one of the most important tenets of the French Revolution, liberty and his wholehearted belief in love as the prime factor of all human progress. The revolution to Shelley was much more than a political upheaval, the French Revolution. It was a spiritual awakening and the beginning of a new life. Liberty in Shelley's work eyes was freedom from external restraint. We associate Shelley with love and liberty as we associate kids with beauty, words with, with nature and Coleridge with something which is of the medieval past. Love is with Shelley a transcendental force kindling all things into beauty, but both the strength and weakness of Shelley's verse is in fact that his fine idealism the idealism that he had and warm human sympathies are clad in shadowy fantasies and lyrics delicate as gossamer. So, the, sometimes it becomes very opaque and sometimes it becomes too mystic and therefore, it becomes like gossamer soft and not transparent. Thought and feeling are etherealized till their presence is discerned only as one discerns the things of dreamland. He has been called the Oberon of poets because he is mystical, he is one who is hard to reach, he is one who is elusive, yet there is some uh, shadowy quality about him. We come to the most beautiful uh, uh, aspect of uh, romantic poetry, John Keats. Formative influences in his work are the medieval Italian verse of Lehan, the pastoral sweetness of Spencer and the inspiration of Greek art first gained throughout the medium of Chapman's Homer. When he had read Chapman's Homer, he had never gone to Greece, but he had known more, almost all of Greek literature here. But his individual genius, though shaped by these influences, soon placed him among the foremost names of his age, while in certain direction he is preeminent. The naturalism of Wordsworth's school is blended here with an extraordinary delicacy of observation, which gives his scenic pictures a unique charm. No poet has excelled Keats at his best for splendor or workmanship. It was said that every word of his is loaded with awe. Endymion, Isabella, the Eve of Saint Agnes. If we want to look for the aesthetics of presentation of creativity, we have to go to Keats. But the odes are, I think, the most imperishable things of English verse by virtue of their Hellenic clarity and sizzle beauty. Hellenic here means Greek, and the poetry comes naturally, as Keats was wont to declare poetry should as leaves to a tree, it should come as leaves to a tree. And this famous line from the ode on a Grecian on, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. If we go to Lord Byron, 
who gives another dimension to romantic poetry that is of heroism and bolder and freer aspects of romanticism. You see these key figures of romantic poets, they are unique in themselves, all their poems, all the works that they did has an individuality, has an involvement, has a freshness which no poet would ever be able to excel. In style and temperament, he is a curious blend of the age of satire and the age of romanticism. And therefore, many call him insincere, not as sincere as Wordsworth, but even then he says, actor has the right to pose, a poet has the right to pose and to create. In that strange mixture of worldly wisdom and poetic beauty, Don Juan, we see Byron at his best. This is a line from Don Juan, she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climb and starry nights, wonderful, best lyrics of our literature. Therefore, it is a mistake however, to describe the romantic poets as simply nature poems, because they were also dealing with central human experiences and problems, which we have reiterated. Wordsworth asserted that it is the mind of man, which is my haunt and the main region of my song. And the use of poetic symbolism, I always seek in what I see, as Shelley had said. Well, now from poetry, let us go to fiction. Very quickly, we have seen Horace Walpole's castle of Otranto proclaim its entrance into fiction. We have Mrs. Radcliffe, we have Gibbon, then historical novel and Sir Walter Scott. And in Frankenstein of Mary Shelley, we find supernaturalism, then uh, Godwin Celeb Williams, Saint Leon and Fleetwood, they are distinct traces of the school of mystery and terror and we come to the epitome of all the novelists of the romantic era, Sir Walter Scott, supposed to be the greatest novelist of the romantic revival, especially in the heart of Middleton and Waverley, we know the very soul of Scotch womanhood and uh, manhood. Well, we cannot do justice to the romantic revival if we do not mention Jane Austen. Skillfully, Jane Austen wielded the difficult task of portraying characters in which no single feature is extravagantly overcharged in her comedy. Her characters were highly amusing, very commonplace within the sphere of domestic drama, very provincial, individually confirming with relationships like Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, Emma, to name a few. Her achievement was of a different kind, she revealed the beauty and interest that underlie ordinary affairs. So, her romanticism when you look into her fiction, you can almost ally it with that of Wordsworth, something which was very, very simple, something which was very, very uh, variety of common life. We come to the essays, a new school of literary appreciation, we have already seen the uh, lyrical ballads and we will see that the revival was a new awareness on how to write poetry and therefore, we have the new criticism which brings in aestheticism as well as different forms of theoretical aspects of how a poem has to be uh, written or read. What sort prefaced to the lyrical ballads, Coleridge's biographia literary, literary and lectures on Shakespeare and other poets, Shelley's The Defense of Poetry in reply to the provocative the four ages of poetry of Peacock, Lamb's specimens of English dramatic poets who lived about the time of Shakespeare. So, the art of the essay if we come into it, Charles Lamb dominates that for he gave fresh sound to the art of the essay, especially his essays of earlier. We have Hazlitt, we have De Quincey, no one could gossip in print more delightfully than he. And we see that romanticism crossed the Atlantic in 1830 to 1865. In literature, it was America's first great creative period, a full flowering of the romantic impulse on American soil, surviving from the federalistic age, where its three major literary figures, we have Bryant, Irving and Cooper emerging as new writers of strength and creative power, where the novelists Horton, Seams, Melvin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, poets Poe, Whitter, Holmes, Longfellow, Lowell, Dickinson and Whitman, the essays Thoreau, Emerson, Holmes, the critics Poe, Lowell and Sims. It was an exuberant and abundant output in American literature. At the end of the civil war in America, a new nation had been born. It was to demand and receive a new literature, less idealistic and more practical, less exalted, more arty, less consciously artistic and more honest and when the American dream had glowed with greatest intensity. So, coming to the end of it, let us discuss. Therefore, in understanding the romantic age, 
what do we have to go into it? We have to understand the major philosophies of Romanticism. We have to understand the influence of, of, of German influence as well as the French influence, how it had crossed the borders to America and how it had flowered into a different form of output, creative output. The most creative, the most abundant, the most fantastic supposed to be and the most beautiful at the same time the sincerest, the most simple and the most essential. What were the effects of Romanticism on the literary works of the time? What years marked the beginning and the end of Romantic period? Which Romantic poet could be considered? Would you consider as responsible for changing the distinctive elements of Romantic poetry? If you consider it one single poet, I do not think it would be doing justice to it all. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you would understand Romantic poetry when you study Keats. Shelley, Wordsworth and, and Coleridge going back into the background, you will be able to understand them better. Thank you. These are the referred texts. Thank you.